and welcome to part one of three of me talking about my final year uni project. It's the end of February just now and I decided that I wanted to make a proper series of videos kind of explaining in depth um, how I approach my project rather than compiling all the clips I had into a kind of messy <laughs> zip file that my tutors would have to wade through at the end of the year. So hopefully this helps explain my project. So I have no idea how long these videos are going to be. Um, I'm going to try and explain everything as concisely but fully as I can. So we'll see how we go. And I'm splitting this into three parts so that it makes a bit more sense kind of where my mind was at um, in each section of my project. Before I get started, if you don't know me, my name's Kirsty um, and I'm a fourth year 3D design student at Grey School of Art in Aberdeen in Scotland. And now let me transport myself all the way back to September 2022 um, when I was starting out, beginning my project. The first few weeks of our project, we were kind of guided on how to begin our project by our tutors. Um, so we were told to come up with a set of keywords um, that would become the starting points for our research. The keywords that I chose were play, creativity, multisensory, wildlife, modularity and materials. These words were based on my design interests. Um, basically for the past two years, I've focused quite heavily on design for children, toy design, design for play, that sort of thing. And I'm generally interested in child development. So I knew from the get go that kids were gonna be a central part to this project. Over the summer, I'd read this book and I'd seen this film. So both were fresh in my mind and I was really inspired by the connection between nature and children. We also had to write a project proposal which went into more detail about what we were hoping to achieve throughout the year. While I was writing my proposal, I was really interested in the perception of insects and how um, kids can often be scared to spend time outside. I knew I wanted my product to encourage the child to be in control of their own play. And I knew that in order to do that, I was gonna have to look at the way that real kids play with each other. I plan to analyze statistics from the toy market and just to allow the design process to lead me. Although I knew that I wanted my product to be high quality, um, I was pretty vague about how I was going to manufacture it at the time, but I knew how important it was to understand parents as well as they're the ones buying. And when I was writing this proposal, I wanted my design to be sellable. So I was really keen to stay in line with health and safety re regulations. Um, to make sure that it was a sellable item at the end of the project. Obviously, it's pretty hard to know where your project is going um, at the very beginning of the year, especially when you're someone as indecisive and easily distracted as I am. So I don't really blame myself for kind of keeping it vague and just basing it on what I knew at the time. Anyway, I then proceeded to um, develop an interest in biomaterials. I started experimenting with things like rice husks, pistachio shells, monkey nut shells, and a lot of potato starch to try and make an interesting material. And I worked on that for about a week. And then I decided this probably wasn't really a very sensible use of my time. Definitely interesting, but not what I wanted to spend the rest of my year doing. I went back to my keywords and really tried to turn the words into actions. I considered the reasons why I had chosen each word and how I planned to use it within my project. For play, I wanted to be playful with my designs. I wanted my designs to encourage play. As my dissertation was based on risky play, it was going to link to my studio project. Being creative improves children's problem solving, decision making and memory. So for child development, creativity is really important. I chose multisensory because I was interested in designing things that are usable for as many people as possible. Conscious of disability and different abilities and creating a multi-sensory experience was how I planned to encourage that. This also linked to nature as the outside world has so many sensory experiences. I feel personally quite connected to nature and wildlife. This links to my interest in sustainability and creating an environmentally friendly product. I see modularity as a great way to evoke creative thinking as well as encourage skills like building. I knew that I was going to have to look at scale and do lots of prototyping. 
Now around this time we were approaching October so it was prime natural textures time and I decided to go out on a bit of a hunt for some bits and pieces um, in nature that would kind of bring the multi-sensory textural side to my design. I did some observational drawings and at this stage I realised I should probably get some ideas down on paper. So here's when I came to idea number one. I was thinking about insects and beetle drives and how insects kind of look like they're made up of lots of different segments. I love Lego um, and I particularly love the system that Lego has um, that basically means that every piece can join to every other piece in some way. So I was kind of aiming for a similar system for these ideas. I remembered that I'd been to a Lego workshop when I went to New Designers in the summer. We'd basically been tasked with an hour to come up with a concept for a new Lego set that was different to what was currently on the market. And my group's idea had been a board game that the players had to build themselves and would be different every time they played it because it would be built in different ways. This led me onto a whole range of ideas. What if the insects possessed different powers depending on what pieces they were comprised of? What about different colours and materials? What about a board game? It could be made up of loads of different hexagons that could be positioned in different ways. What about puzzle pieces? Scrabble tiles? Cylinders? It could fold up into a 3D shape. How would that even work? Sometimes my ideas are a bit overwhelming. I did quite like the idea of tiles making up some sort of world. I 3D printed this prototype of three tiles that could pop in and out of their places and I added natural textures to each of them to link it back to the concept I've been working with. They make such a good noise. From this I identified that if I was making a board game then feedback was going to be a really important aspect. Some of my key influences at this time were this design by Ollie Watkins, the game Labyrinth, and this travel-sized Scrabble set. I considered that having a prescriptive game might go against my own philosophy of encouraging kids to be imaginative and creative um, when they're playing. I thought that maybe a sort of build your own world type thing might be more in line with my own beliefs. I was really thinking about myself as a child. Me and my sisters and my friends, we just loved coming up with like imaginary stories, imaginary lands, intricate games with intricate characters and stuff. This fan toy also got me thinking about scale, particularly as I was still thinking about bugs at this point. And I thought it was interesting to think about how to make everyday objects bigger so that tiny worlds could exist inside them. I think this was the beginning of my second line of ideas, which was the small worlds. As a kid, I was really fascinated with dioramas. So I was thinking a lot about dioramas within everyday objects. Winter Wonderland in a tin can, milk carton farm and storm in a teacup all made the shortlist, but welly houses were my favorite idea. I got some kids wellies from the charity shop and I cut them up. I thought about room layouts and what kind of rooms might be inside and how the inner world might relate to the outer welly. And I got as far as making this prototype to understand the scale of rooms that could be found in a welly. And then I had a bit of an identity crisis. <laughs> I realised that I'd been kind of blindly pushing the identity of toy designer on myself across the last few years honestly um, and I kind of stepped back to think about what I really wanted to do with my life as a designer um, and I realised that I'm really interested in set design and landscape design um, as well as design for kids. I think this came as more of a shock to the people around me than it even did to me. I spoke to my tutor and he supported my decision to shift my perspective onto something bigger but still stemming from my research on play, creativity and children which was play environment design. In a city full of conventional kids play parks, I kind of fancied myself as a bit of a Arathia Lucko, Kaz Holman, Rusty Keeler, Heli Nibelong, Simon Terrell or even a Marjorie Allen. I set about ideating elements of a playground inspired by natural features such as vines, buttress roots, rocks, trees and moss. I would consider woodlands as nature's playground, so I initially planned to set my playground within some sort of woodland, and then I realised that made absolutely no sense, because kids who have access to woodlands already have a fun place to play, so it's kids in cities that maybe need a bit of nature. So as December approached, we were fastly approaching the end of the first semester, and we had a big crit to explain where we were. 
with our project. And at this point I'd used a bit of gravity sketch and I'd used a fair amount of CAD modelling and I was kind of well on my way to designing a playground. I was also incredibly interested in how my rural childhood related to childhood in the city and what experiences I had that city kids wouldn't have or experiences that city kids had that I would never have had growing up in the countryside. I, at this point I kind of reflected on risky play in quite a different way having finished my dissertation. I'm going to do a separate video explaining my dissertation and going into more depth about Marjorie Allen, who she is and how she relates to this project because I think that it's quite a lot to explain uh, in as just a short segment of a single video. By December I had looked at um, what I was calling the space which is basically the area on top of the Denburn car park I think it is. It's a completely underutilised space because it's so central to the city and it's pretty much unused. Definitely not used in the daytime. There's a lot of sort of broken glass and a lot of unsafe looking things, maybe not in the way that kids would be encouraged to play in that space. I identified that as a space that was prime location and size to maybe be redeveloped. That was what I was basing my ideation on at that point, looking at the shape of the space, thinking about how it could be adapted to be a play space that promoted risky play in a innovative way. Particularly when looking at my own childhood uh, in the countryside in comparison to an urban childhood, um, I looked at the amount of free space that I had to roam. This was kind of the amount of space we were allowed to just roam free. I mean, as you can see, it's fields, it's all kind of green. The roads that are there are relatively small roads. There is there is an A road, which, you know, was a slightly more dangerous road. But by the age of sort of six or seven, we'd kind of been primed to, you know, you know how to cross a road. It's a singular road that you have to worry about. We were very much like free range kids, especially me and my friend Lucy. We would just, we would just go wherever and we did take risks and there was no adults around, but we'd been doing that from a very young age and we continued to do that up until maybe the end of primary school at sort of 11. So for contrast, if we look at a map of Aberdeen from the same height above the ground, you can see this. And personally, I would not let my six-year-old child just roam free in this area. You know, it seems almost crazy to think that that's the amount of space that like, my mum didn't know where I was. I didn't have any way of contacting her and I was six years old, but we were allowed to roam this area. Whereas you would never maybe allow your child to roam that area in a city because there are so many more risks and dangers so that was another thing that um, I considered, the fact that kids in the city are gonna just generally be more supervised by adults than kids in the countryside. So maybe they don't have the same abilities to develop certain qualities and skills that kids in the countryside do because kids in the countryside have the opportunity to do things without being surrounded by adults. There's a really interesting article by Hannah Rosen on The Atlantic, I'll put a link in the description, which I talk about in my dissertation. It's about how kids actually need to be left alone in order to develop certain social qualities. I was interested within my project on how I could create a space that kids could be sort of very loosely supervised or maybe supervised by by adults who weren't their parents to sort of allow them to explore, explore themselves and explore the environment. Marjorie Allen's adventure playgrounds have play workers who are trained specifically to almost be invisible and only really come to the forefront when they are needed and when or when they need to step in to support a child in a way that the child maybe would benefit more from having an adult. My mum also works in a play group and when I was telling her about these play workers she said that they are trained to ask children whether they feel safe and whether they are making a safe choice rather than telling them just to stop instantly, which is kind of a concept explored by Rusty Keeler in his book, What Is Your Yes? It's a lot more beneficial for kids to 
make these choices, make these risky choices themselves rather than adults stepping in before they've even had the chance to make that choice or even had the chance to consider, am I in danger or am I safe? Just changing the language up so that the child actually has the chance to develop these risk assessment skills themselves. So I'm gonna end part one here and move on to part two where I'm gonna be talking about my interim show and kind of going into semester two, where my new mindset was and how that progressed my project. I was definitely kind of here, there and everywhere with different ideas kind of popping up out of everywhere. Um, I was obviously writing my dissertation at the same time, which took up a huge amount of my time. And therefore I think I progressed a lot slower um, <laughs> in semester one than I have so far already in semester two. Um, so that's definitely interesting to think about and reflect on. If you like this video and you're interested in learning more about um, life at art school and my project generally and my life generally, then consider subscribing to me because I'm going to be posting a few videos. I've got a few videos planned for after I graduate that um, are going to talk about my experiences at art school, especially having studied through the COVID pandemic. If that's something that interests you, then please consider subscribing as well. Okay, thank you. Bye.